C'est bon. Disons que.
only place where your da data is in the clear is on your own device or on the device that you want to, uh, like of your friends that want, you want them to have an access to. And uh, the point with the roughest implication is the social graph. We consider it really important for the social graph not to be available to the wrong people, like who is talking to whom, who is connected with whom. And that means a lot of things. And uh, well, you probably all know some argumentation why the social graph is important because you're part. I'll just give you one more. Uh, remember uh, that uh, movie and the movie plot uh, from Terminator was something like, here's the machine coming back from the future to either save, protect, or kill uh, the future uh, revolutionary, uh, the, the kid who will one day uh, lead the revolution uh, of the people against the evil machines. And uh, the problem with that, uh, with that uh, plot uh, today is you don't need time travel to do it. You just need con deep analysis of uh, all the surveillance data that is happening right now, you need an analysis of the social graph. And I presume with uh, sufficient intelligent algorithms, you can pick out those people who might be leading a revolution in the future. That is dramatically dangerous for democracy. So if we uh, start by viewing things from that perspective and saying, okay, we cannot trade those requirements, well, then the entire internet as we know it kind of falls apart. The certification system of SSL is already broken, and why should we trust any authorities? Uh, the domain name system is, is but let's not go into all the details. Uh, email, even if you apply some encryption on top of it, it's, uh, there are so many flaws about uh, encrypted email, so much wrong about it. Uh, it's not protecting your social graph, it's not providing forward secrecy, and it has a lot of other problems. Um, over Jabber, it's slightly better, but it's still a federated network, and it, you still expose your social graph, even if you use OTR. Uh, it's the uh, same trouble with uh, voice over IP. The, the whole idea of federation that we have been propagating as uh, how it should be, like we should be decentralized and federated, actually doesn't work. We have to go beyond that. And uh, we even go as far as saying that the border gateway protocol that is uh, used in, on, uh, between the large providers and the nations of the internet to route packets around the world, even that is totally flawed and insecure. It only works, the only reason why DGP works is because those nations and companies have signed contracts to each other, so they're all trusting each other. Wow. And how much that is secure is known from uh, an event that happened in 2010. So it's a pre-Snowden event that wasn't as exciting back then as it is <coughs> now. Uh, back then, uh, China Telecom, by mistake, uh, rerouted the entire American traffic uh, to China for uh, some 15 minutes. And in that period, they had plenty of occasion of uh, looking into all the things that are happening on the American uh, network. Whoops! So, um, is there something that we can do by legislation as we are parts? Um, we would like to do something about it. Well, uh, there's a problem. If we just say legislate by legislation, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be looking at all those packets. You shouldn't be using all that data. Uh, the problem is there's no way to check. If, I mean, if, if we were protecting a physical envelope, a letter, then you could somehow find a way to figure out, oh, this envelope has been opened by somebody else, or something. If, uh, if necessary, going deep, deep as DNA or something. Well, with digital data, you can do it. You will never know if somebody looked at the data or not. And the idea of, of uh, finding some controls for protecting the data is just not realistic. Uh, there is no possibility for jurisdiction control activity. Exactly, that's why I say the separation of powers are kind of like technological problems. So we need a technological solution, and then we can might be able to apply legislation on top of it. And um, 
this is actually pretty much consensual among, uh, among the people that uh, went to this uh, 33C event uh, in, in Hamburg. And there are several technologies using this kind of architecture. It's a new internet architecture. And uh, it's actually more familiar than when I explain it to you. It's not so, so completely new. Um, so first thing is forget about domain names. They're broken. The, the address system is not secure. The new approach is to root by public keys. That means your identity, that crypto, your cryptographic identity where you receive, uh, uh, that, that, allow, that enables you to receive uh, messages in a secure way, is also your address. And therefore, your packet cannot go anywhere else. And if you're receiving a packet on that address, it means it's for you. And it's, it's just uh, drop the, the whole problem of things ending up in the wrong place uh, are, is kind of removed by that approach. That why this has been being done already by some 10 years, or by various technologies <coughs> in some, some forms. But it was always considered like paranoid stuff. Uh, what that means in, in practice is uh, we don't need a, a buzzword.com address at all. And uh, we use, uh, for instance, a nice way to solve the, the addressing problem is to use a QR code. Okay, This is actually not a, a QR code of that kind. The QR code would contain the public key, would not contain a web address. So uh, the good thing about the QR code, once it's printed on paper, it's really hard to man in the middle. <laughs> it's on paper. So that's really practical. And if companies were advertising on, on, on a magazine with the QR code of their public key, that's a lot more secure than writing a domain name. So you can, if you're using that, you can be sure that you're talking to that company. You're talking to that person if they give you a QR code with a public key. And uh, it's also better for usability because you can just hold it in front of your webcam. I mean, anyone who isn't even familiar with all of this stuff, if the software is done in such a way that you just need to uh, hold that thing in front of the webcam, then the computer just tells you what you want to do. You want to telephone with this person, you want to uh, surf to their website, or you want to make friendship, whatever. Um, so all the trouble of, of cryptography and the, the, the complications that, we're from, uh, that we know from PGP that kind of like, it's not necessary. Um, there are other options when you don't have the possibility of exchanging the, such a QR code. You can still uh, um, uh, adopt people from the social graph, uh, like you already have friends in common. Then you can pick out uh, to t talk with that person. Oh, I know somebody who knows her. And then if you have met somewhere at a party, you could have exchanged a, a shared secret on a piece of paper. And that is cryptographically sufficient. There are methods to uh, ensure that there can be no man in the middle in the communication. Um, and there's also another method that is uh, very um, ad hoc, very spontaneous, which is by using a um, telephone uh, or a vo voice over internet connection. Not the telephone. Um, a voice telephony, encrypted voice telephony connection by which um, the both sides will, uh, from the data of the connection, will uh, both uh, softwares will show uh, a, a code on the screen and uh, both users, so when they say hello, uh, they read this code to each other and if the code is identical then there cannot be a man in the middle. So that's a practical way that you can even bootstrap a secure connection without having to have any preparatory steps. So these are various methods for creating, a, a, for bootstrapping a really secure social connection over the internet for a large amount of the population. And well, I think that by these approaches we can make it a, a natural and, and make uh, and create the necessary acceptance to get out of the hell of the unsafe existing internet. 
Another uh, step is uh, the distributed hash table. This is technology that has been in use in the peer-to-peer -peer world for uh, uh, over a decade. And uh, it, it allows to uh, look up information in a distributed way without uh, anyone having control over this information and having a cryptographic protection that this information is correct. In fact, uh, with advanced, uh, advanced uh, implementation of disputed hash table even managed to hide the fact that you're looking something up. Um, what it can replace is uh, DNS and, uh, and the certification system. And uh, it may, basically makes uh, the, the server federation as such uh, unnecessary because we can have all our um, applications function end-to-end. Uh, -end. And uh, we still use servers to uh, run uh, efficient uh, if efficient infrastructure, but those servers have no clue who they're uh, helping, what, what they're doing, uh, for whom, and they have no access to any data. So, uh, there's uh, uh, the, the job description of the server administrator kind of disappears because uh, we don't need any Jabber administrators, any mail server administrators, it's all gone. So the next thing that uh, is built on top of that uh, um, resolution mechanism is to have a, net, uh, a network of, of connections between these nodes. And uh, they can uh, be doing onion routing, they can be a, a mesh network. Um, Tor is a nice example of that, so what I'm talking about is stuff like Tor <laughs> to simplify. But uh, here's a whole series of uh, other projects which have kind of similar architectures. Tor is the most famous one for actually doing onion routing, so doing the proper obfuscation of who is talking to whom. I2P kind of does that as well. The other ones uh, need to improve in that area. But the other ones are interesting for other reasons, like Freenet is good as, uh, this, at distributing uh, to many people. And uh, GNU-NET, CJDNS, and uh, Net2O, and Rhizome, uh, they uh, are doing actual mesh, uh, actual routing replacement. Like, the routing that they do does not depend on the internet being able to connect to IP addresses. They can find a route between uh, nodes by themselves, so you can operate it between your Wi-Fi gadgets, or it, it can also be deployed instead of the border gateway protocol on an intercontinental level. So that's a really a fundamental uh, shift away from uh, the traditional internet. So something's happening here, and these technologies kind of need to get together. We just need one, a good one that does it all. And so we have a few too many. And. Um, Next thing uh, is something that I always uh, bring about, but uh, I haven't heard anyone complain yet, is that uh, <coughs> that we also need a solution for all those applications that talk to a lot of people, or that kind of, uh, some, when something becomes uh, popular, then uh, a lot of people want to access it, and that's where, where all the uh, most uh, open source uh, applications <coughs> break down and do not work unless you have a cloud or you have a content delivery network. So in most, this is a, a, a thing that is to a large extent in the hands of the corporate world. BitTorrent is one of the few exceptions. So what the hell is BitTorrent doing? BitTorrent builds distribution trees by making people connect in a chain to each other and so the more people want something the bigger the tree becomes and it still scales well enough to distribute the content to everybody. This kind of distribution trees need to be integrated into these uh, routing technologies because I mean I2P has been doing some bit on top of I2P 
seems to kind of work, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to try with uh, millions of users. Like, it needs to be integrated better because otherwise there's too much overhead. And, and that is uh, an interesting challenge, and that would mean that uh, we could deploy the finally, like, the, the frequent question well, why can't we have a free and open Twitter replacement? Because as long as we haven't solved this problem, we actually don't have a solution. <coughs> and ironically, um, what uh, those cloud and, and content delivery networks and those cloud services do when they provide this kind of high reliability is exactly the same thing. They are doing distribution trees as well inside the cloud. <coughs> they have an advantage for them. It's a slightly easier because they don't have any trust problem, like they can trust their own nodes, they all buy them, bought them, they have contracts. So uh, they can do it all unencrypted and they can do it all uh, without uh, any security issues within their network. So it's easier for them. Also they don't have to go backwards through a DSL line. <laughs> So and and so the fifth point that I was mentioning is uh, is the is what you get on top of that. Once you have a distribution tree and you get all the people connected, then uh, you can finally declare your social graph a private information. You can choose who has the access to this social graph, which is make it available to your friends or not make it available depending on on your needs. <coughs> and uh, outside surveillance would not be able to find out. So, I presume this is where we are heading if we want uh, an actually functional new internet. And uh, what we then want to have on top of this are all the usual things. It's uh, mail and messaging, social networking, telephony, conferencing. And basic things are like the web itself. Actually, for mail, there's a very nice uh, new solution, uh, a Tor-based mail system called Pawn. And I recommend the presentation. It would be uh, like uh, we're, we're editing the videos now, and we just finished editing that video. It's going to appear on some uh, 30C3 uh, uh, websites, media websites, um, the, the presentations from uh, on the piece of paper. And uh, that is a, a very interesting talk to understand how deep the uh, next generation of mail can go far, far beyond PGP, providing much better security. <coughs> and, but there are also similar mail systems for I2P, so to mention that there, there and, and some other, so there, there's uh, there are already better solutions out there. They're just not being accepted because um, of, I don't know, the political correctness of PGP, I don't know. Um, there are no easy solutions for social networking. Uh, there are some solutions for telephony coming along slowly. Um, and. Uh, and there's a solution for uh, for a more secure web. Um, any like Tor has them. A lot of all of them have some way to access things at the other side. And uh, uh, the .onion addresses of Tor are, are such an example. And uh, it's it's using the public key as so a fingerprint as the address itself. So it's implementing exactly that scheme. Fingerprint.onion. I presume some of you have, have seen such addresses. <laughs> and uh, ironically, this method with the .onion address is actually safer than any than most HTTPS addresses. Like I would rather do banking over a .onion address than over a regular banking because uh, the banking can be man in the middle. Uh, so uh, it's ironical that this stuff is being called the dark web. It should be the light web. It's the web that is finally actually secure. <laughs> I mean, okay, that onion has still a few bugs, and it's imperfect, and we need to work on it. And it's being worked on to make it more uh, re 
reliable, but it's right now it's already, as from my perspective, more uh, reliable than HTTPS. So uh, if you want to do real business, you shouldn't be trusting uh, the old methods. Like, otherwise you might just happen to experience uh, espionage. Um, okay, I'll skip this one. So um, with an architecture like that, we can actually have legislation on top. We can have legislation that requires such kind of infrastructure that fosters, right, right now, um, cool. I'm going too fast, <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, um, we're also already uh, starting to get uh, funding for these technologies. It's, uh, things are, are moving, uh, like before Edward Snowden, uh, the EU decided to invest the money in the wrong way, but this time it looks like uh, it's going to head the right way. And uh, there are also some, uh, some uh, private investors and some uh, foundations. The Valhalla Foundation is supporting us. So uh, finally, things are moving. Just, uh, just uh, yesterday, uh, the speaker of the ECO, uh, uh, what's the name, association, the Electronic Commerce Association of Germany, like a totally new economy type of uh, organization, he mention us, uh, our project, as a way to go and a way to uh, something to look into. And I said, whoa, mm -hmm. are we at that point? I mean, this ha has changed so quickly. 2011, we were getting ignored. <laughs> now, a couple of years later, it's like, whoa, exploding. The interest is exploding faster and faster. And, uh, well, there, there's even a step beyond just funding these, uh, these projects. Uh, <clears throat> we could be um, um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll go to this point um, we could uh, require this kind of obfuscated and encrypted communications in all telephony and computing devices sold after 2014 like this could be a EU directive okay, it could be 2015 I don't know uh, it would mean that all the companies who want to continue to sell devices to you, uh, to, to the population, they just have to adapt to the new rules. No big deal. It's not, nothing dramatic happens all the time. I mean, the requirements are to protect the constitution. Uh, we cannot play around with this. And how to make something like that uh, accessible to the politicians, to the old politicians, to the politicians who do not understand, who are probably not present here, uh, all we need to do from you is to prioritize. That's the rule. That's the actual job of politicians. Politicians, if they try to understand everything, it usually breaks apart. But if they just put the right priorities, instead of confusing the heads, saying, "Oh, but you haven't considered copyright," well, you need priorities. Even in the Declaration of Human Rights, the copyright is down there. There's a reason why it is down there. So. Are the secrets of correspondence, the digital freedom of assembly, and I consider like the social graph is kind of the digital equivalent of the freedom of assembly, or maybe it might be part of the secrets of correspondence, but it, it must be somewhere in there. Is it more important than any other interest or not? Take that decision. Are you on the side of the lobbyists? Are you on the side of the surveillance paranoids? Or are you on the side of your own damn constitution, if you have one? So that's a pretty simple thing. The next assertion is also pretty simple. The way the internet is right now is not respecting the constitutions, depending on the constitution that you have, and depending on, on the priorities. It's not respecting the, uh, the human rights. We need to fix it. It's just broken. That's why this kind of legislation proposal, which fixes that kind of internet, and uh, it's not very friendly to lobbyists, but you have to, we have to get to, to that. And actually, it's it's not depends on on the point of view because if you introduce something like that, it's a level play field for all companies. So why should they be so 
negative about it. It's just uh, new rules for everyone and uh, the, the game is changed. Uh, collecting data is no longer a business model. Let's we'll just, just figure out something else. Let's make nice new business models that are um, morally more acceptable. I, mean, I, I, I was um, running a, a company doing uh, chat services uh, in, in the 2000s and, uh, and I kind of lost my clients to Facebook because uh, they were just starting to offer things for free and, uh, and so uh, I was too expensive, they didn't spend money on my uh, software anymore and well uh, there was there's a loss um, in, in quality because uh, I was not even giving my clients access to my servers. I was giving them statistics at the end of the event, uh, how popular uh, their chat has been, but they didn't get any IP addresses, any data about the users uh, using the chat system. That was my idea of, of Datenschutz, data protection. I thought I was just being compliant with the law. Well, it's an alternative solution if you just take it to a different jurisdiction and from there you can abuse all that user data and that's your business model. But, well, that should not be the way it works. So, uh, all these small companies that used to exist in the 90s and 2000s in the internet, they have lost their business model uh, to, to Facebook and they might just be coming back and saying, hey, great, we can do regular, normal business again. And uh, such a, a legislation strategy, it's funny, but it takes care of all, all the things that we have been bothering as internet politicians so far. Copyright. It's just not, not, I mean, if the communication between two people is, has a higher priority and it's private, and then, yeah, there could be copyright infringements happening, but it's, it, the priority is clear and, and it's not a problem. You can, data retention is what we're talking about, sort of graph, so we just solved that. We have better data protection, net neutrality. It's so sweet. If all the packs uh, are coming from somewhere, going somewhere, everything is a, a you don't know what's inside. You can't abuse, uh, you can't prioritize anything. So it's automatically, you have to be staying net neutral. It ha all, by necessity in the proposal it says that it has to be a free and open uh, a software implementation. And we are also introducing the requirement for hardware tra transparency so there are not, no nasty surprises in the hardware itself and the microcode of the devices. So that proposal is available on the website you broke the internet.org and click on the legislation link and have a look at it. So that's it, thank you. We have a dinner, a social thing at uh, 8 o'clock in uh, Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Questions, please. So, what shall we do after we come home? We, we come home. What, what, we do? what should you should be doing when you go home? Um, well, uh, after we come home, what shall we do? You could uh, take a political initiative, you could take a technological initiative uh, in this area. Um, another popular thing I say is so you can help uh, uh, Linux distributions become um, become uh, deterministically compilable, but that's another topic. <laughs> So, so uh, if imagine a regular citizen, uh, you know, he's not a programmer. Yeah, go on the street and say this is a topic. Like, get, get annoyed that we are currently, uh, even just GSM, even the SMS on your phone is not secure. We are being surveilled on everything. And uh, it's our, our, our 
the foundations of our democracy are, is in danger, that's a reason to go on the streets each day, like each Monday. On, yeah. the, on the same top topic, most people are not are only users and they are a little bit afraid of technology and don't love it, but they want to use it. And the success of Facebook and Co is uh, the simplicity, yes. the convenience. <coughs> it's so convenient, it's so practical, and it's fun, and they love to expose themselves. And if you talk to these people and say, but you are being observed, you are being inspired, and, so what? Uh, so what? Uh, so there's still a lot of work uh, to uh, making them understand how, how uh, dramatic it is. As an example, I work at an institute where my colleagues, we are all rather political thinkers and they love democracy, but they, most of them are political scientists and political scientists simply have a different mentality than uh, engineers. And they are more that finally <laughs> understood how to work with this uh, word, word processor. And they don't want to change anything. They don't want, even, even don't want to go to open source because they feel they must learn a new, and that's a nuisance. And I'm glad it works this way, and my secretary does it. And the changes always bring frictions. We don't want this. And that's the mentality we must face. So your ideas, which I really love, only will be successful if you really manage to be really convenient. Yes. And I, so far, uh, I must admit, I, I like computers more than my uh, colleagues, but most of what you said is really new for me, but very interesting. So I wonder whether it's possible to get into a dialogue. They even don't want to appreciate open source uh, software. Yes. We keep an eye on uh, on uh, usability and also on the, the on the plan of offering some uh, new cool things, cool features that cannot be done with the internet today. So we would like to provide some extra things that are a uh, motivation to start using this technology, and so it just slowly grows into use. Like like people have slowly migrated from MySpace to Facebook. They actually were on both platforms for a while and then they got tired of using MySpace. And uh, the same of kind of uh, uh, movement can happen uh, towards these kind of technologies and they just uh, forget to <coughs> start Skype in the morning because they already have a better telephone system. And, and so uh, slowly all technologies can be fade out. And uh, ironically, uh, there are some aspects of this technology that make it much easier from the usability perspective. Uh, the, the usability of PGP sucks really bad because it tries to work on top of email. And it just totally doesn't fit together. And uh, if you do it all in an organic way, then it's actually easier to use than the current internet. You don't even have to go to a website. So, uh, the, some aspects are actually easier than the current internet, and uh, we'll have to leverage that and, and make use of that. Maybe, uh, for example, um, with PGP and crypto, and it's, uh, it is a nuisance, mm -hmm. but if you use it, and if you yourself only send out stuff like this, people will start, you know... Ignoring it. No, no, they will not start ignoring it. They want to talk to you, yeah? And the more you use it, the more it... You know, the more people you will take with you because you're the one who can do something that somebody else can't do that's not that hard. But then this forces new technology to be better, to be easier. So you have to use the nuisance to then, <laughs> you know? The nuisance is a tool. Yeah. Sam? In direct response to your first question, um, what you can do when you go home. Um, there's obviously a right and a wrong way to, to run Tor relays, to run an ITP node. Um, in general, trying to increase the capacity to be able to reroute packets for people who have a very unfree experience of the internet and materially makes a difference that you help pass uh, some of that traffic um, for the benefit of other users. And similarly, you know, seeding content for open source uh, ISOs, distributions of Linux, Things like this is a material way that you can use your internet connection to actually spread that culture or spread that technology and make it more effective. Um, looking through all of the keywords in the talk of technology suggested and informing yourself and other people that you care to communicate with how to use those technologies. Um, 
and then demand people that you think are smarter than you with technology to like make it easier for you to use that stuff. So be like, poke your geekiest friend and be like, hey, how do I set up ITP? Like literally, I will I will buy you pizza and or coffee, and you will show me that. Like make a social excuse or a reason to hang out and learn that stuff. That would be a good way to get started. You go. Great. I don't think that has any chance of being any success. I mean, in economics, you have this idea of utility for a certain person. Questions, not opinions. I'll cut that out. <laughs> and so, uh, well, how, a question it, how it will it create more utility for a person than... Yeah, I would like to know if you have some good examples example of uh, why people need to protect their data, you know, because I think that's mm -hmm. what we are missing right now. It's giving examples to Opinion. people to, uh, to explain them. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> no, I'm not really that good uh, at that as well. Uh, I, I made that Terminator example. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the espionage is, is a, a strong uh, message, speak, but not for the normal people. Yeah, it, it, it talks to the, the business. But that's an important place to start, too. So. And uh, I'll. I think uh, uh, we'll we'll see the point, uh, the moment when uh, uh, we will be in deep shit. Oh, and we'll be in deep shit, and, and people will understand that uh, that their freedom is actually at stake with this whole thing. Uh, the idea on the same point to do with your colleague as speak about crypto party that we have also organized. Uh, what we miss is instant party, you know. Uh, yes, really, it's about you come in with your, with your laptop like this, full of Windows bullshit, and then you go back home and it's full of non-Windows bullshit, and you know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> and you can come so you mean two weeks after for or, uh, explanation, see. because you miss yeah. some information, and then you come yeah. two weeks after and they give you information about how it works, and so yeah. And you stop to use it, because, for example, in Belgium, yeah. we have one city, yeah. Ghent, they are working with open office. You know, at my, my Ministry of Finance, we have 22,000 people. We all have Microsoft Office and we all have Open Office, a Libre Office. But when I send a, a document with .udt, my colleagues say, what's that? <laughs> like, like Miss said. They don't want to change. They say, no, I'm, I mean, my habit with words, I have my habit with Excel. I don't want to go to this calculator from, you know. I say, fuck, it's the same, you know. But they don't use. So we need to convince people, and to convince people to change the mentality of the people uh, to use it, that's the most difficult, because they don't care. On Facebook it's the same, as I heard you uh, fighting against Facebook, I fight the same as you. For example, how is it possible that all the discussions I have with cash are all in the same things, when I want to, to scrap them, they go to archive, then I need to click five times for each conversation to scrap it. I have thousand conversations, if I want to scrap all, yeah. I need, uh, I don't know how much hours to scrap it on Facebook, what can I do? I see th some people if attack Facebook on USA for that, for that point. But maybe if we made a collective and we, if we, we can yes. attack, because if we don't get the money of the data, so the first solution, but all the parents say, Paul, you are wrong, is I want my money. So I want my Twitter <coughs> money each day, my Facebook money each day, but they say, no, that's not good. So <laughs> maybe we need to attack them, to sue them. Oh, to sue them, that, that could be a plan, like, you're Ill illegal and unconstitutional. <laughs> ah, well, actually, uh, well, actually I, I think uh, Facebook is an uh, easier target than, uh, than uh, Microsoft Word. <laughs> like, uh, that old stuff is really uh, quite reliant, but uh, Facebook, uh, I mean, a good alternative social network, which is cooler because it runs on your own computer and it's not running on some website, uh, that might actually uh, uh, rock and, and distract people away from Facebook because they want it, not because uh, it's politically better. Which, which one is doing that? Huh? Which, one, which net social network is working on, uh, on your own computer, actually? Well, uh, c currently, um, uh, Nightweb, I think, is the only one. There's another yeah, one. Just Nightweb! Diaspora uh, <laughs> can be run on your computer if you install all the stuff. The yeah, thing. right. Nightweb is a tool on top of ITP. Diaspora is federated, so it 
you know, you address the, the problem. The problem with Diaspora is uh, most people are always on the same servers and uh, it, should it become popular, then Google would be running the most popular. <laughs> uh, just as it happens for Jabber and several other protocols, as soon as, uh, as it turns really popular, then the most important node comes from Google. Did you have a... Uh, all right. Um, um, the, the question about why we should use this, etc., is always being asked, and um, for myself, I've so far identified two things which I think are really cool to talk about. The one is um, the article that was just in EFF about gay rights and the gay movement and their problems with uh, privacy yeah, in, the, in the States because people are really getting uh, harassed a lot. Mm. The other one which I found really interesting is. Um, uh, in East Germany, the Catholic Church has a real problem because they do, um, what is it, uh, on telephone they uh, help people, yeah, and this falls under privacy regulations. They're not allowed to talk about it, yeah, you know, when you go to a priest and tell that you've done something wrong. So now that they know that the telephone lines are monitored, they can't do it actually by a telephone anymore. So Great! Yeah? So that's... That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're not going to be, to split the... Yeah, the 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 <laughs> it's just something where I might have a problem with that whole concept, but they are affected. And this is something out of people's life, where, they, where you can quite easily explain um, that, there is a, that there is a problem. There's a few more, but those are the two that I currently have identified for myself as things that people understand. They're very quite contradictory as well. I mean, like gay movement, Catholic Church, it's quite an interesting... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two completely opposite use cases. Anyone else? Or are we done? We're going to have some lunch. Yes. Mm. Can you just speak a little bit Italian for them? A little bit Italian? What's that you want to tell me? Because <laughs> no, she didn't believe it. <laughs> She's working for heavy. That girl.